So I'm gonna do just introduce you after this, and then okay. we'll get going. Cool. <clears throat> oh damn it! <laughs> that was such an exciting build, too. Yeah, that was a good start. That was a. I good... actually would like that as an intro. You do this really intense music, and then you always fuck it up. And it's like, <laughs> oh damn it! And then it just like starts again, and it's like. Yeah. Da-da. Da-da. All right, all right. I gotta do that again. Okay, cool. All right. My guest today is Joshua Rabinowitz. You've seen him in Mike Berbiglia's Don't Think Twice, True TV's Friends of the People, and Adam Devine's House Party, as well as a bunch of other places. He's a writer of the most recent seasons of The Carmichael Show and Broad City. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, You've been busy lately. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. All's been good. Um, (laughs) How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I, I'm, I'm, you just got back from L.A. Yeah. Yeah. I was in L.A. from like uh, October to May working at, uh, at the Carmichael show. Yeah. And I've been here for, you know, back for a couple of months. Do you, which do you prefer? Is it, uh, do, do you like one versus the other? Is New York your, your home? I grew up like outside New York, so I've always, like, I feel more comfortable there. I've not, I've like spent time in L.A. That was the longest I've spent by grew to like it a lot more when I was there for a, like that extended period of time. And also yeah. the job was really fun. I think if I was doing something that I didn't like, then I would dislike a place, but yeah. the, the work was really fun. So I really liked yeah, it. Yeah. I think that's the thing is that a lot of people will criticize LA and say, uh, the traffic, the people like, those are the common things that people say are, right. are shitty about the city. But I think it does matter. Like, are you making enough money to sustain yourself in <laughs> yeah. a city like New yeah. York or L.A.? Totally. Uh, and are you doing work that you actually enjoy? Completely. Yeah. It's like that really lets me know if I'm happy or not. It's like <laughs> if I'm liking where I'm going during the day. And you work most of the day when, you know, when you're working on a like a long schedule like that. So if that's fun, then it, everything feels fun. I feel was like. it was it pretty intensive a schedule? Um, there was like, you know, long hours, but in like a fun way. It's like, you know, it was live uh, audience taping. So it's like the week leading up to shooting. It's like you're rewriting stuff leading up to that. So it's like, you know, it has to get done by that date. It's like a hard deadline. So yeah. Um, so in that way, it can be like the hours can be later, but all in like a really always like fun way. It's like exciting. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about what I guess. What are you doing right now? Since you just finished up that show, you're you're over here in New York. Yeah, and then we'll we'll kind of go back and talk about how you got started out. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we've wrapped that. I'll be here doing stand up, and we're gonna do some like stuff on the road this fall, and then Broad City will come out in the fall. Um, so but, you work? Did you just work on that's already written? Or yeah, produced? Broad City. Uh, we were, the writing was actually last year, and then they shot. Uh, this, uh, like, I think it was like from February to April or May. It was while we were working on the Carmichael show Mm -hmm. and then, um, it'll come out. I think it's uh, sometime this fall, like late summer, fall. Yeah. I think the, the tough thing is, and something that I'm realizing having just started to do bigger scope projects that really take up six, 12 months, sometimes longer. Yeah. Uh, you have to be very careful about those projects that you get into because oh, you totally. have to make sure that you really love it and that this is really something you want to execute on because yeah. by saying yes to that, you're saying no to literally everything else. <laughs> right. <That's laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. No, it's like, I really have always tried to have that be like a guiding principle with everything. It's like, if you don't like it, you know, you have to really be sure that there's some sort of end to those means because <laughs> yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah. it's like, I know a lot of people who just, if you're going from thing to thing, it can be really hard not to take those opportunities. But sometimes the things that you let go can end up being really valuable because two weeks later, somebody asks you to do something that you really like. Um, So it can be really hard to let those opportunities you know, come and go and whatnot. Yeah. So the Carmichael Show and Brad City were both things I was like so excited about because they're both things that I was like a fan of and really, really enjoyed and felt like really excited to like get to be a part of it yeah um and then uh you know try to always have that be the bar of like oh this is something that would be so cool and i'd be really proud to to have people see because there's so much stuff that's not good it's like the last thing you want to do is like make your friends and family go see something that you made that's terrible and you know that it's terrible and you're like but you should please watch it yeah please support me (laughs) that's like Derek sivers he founded the company cdbaby.com if you remember back in the day yeah and uh 
he wrote a book and, and his main thing in it, one of the things that at least stuck out to me was that when you're making a decision, it has to either be a hell yes or a no. If it's not a hell yes, if you're not 100% um, into this project or idea, then it's a no. That's, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, but it's, it's very hard in practice. Well, obviously. you know what I would say is that in the, in the beginning, that practice doesn't really hold up that well because right. you have zero opportunities and Absolutely. you're just getting started out. I would say, say yes to everything. Like when, well, except for like things that maybe question your morals. Right. Of uh, course. Uh, yeah. Like when I first started out, tons of wedding videos, tons yeah. of, dude, I did like the bar mitzvah intro videos, <laughs> like where I would film kids cool. playing basketball and yeah. create this, like we used like, like. Dr. Dre or some like yeah, yeah, Eminem yeah. music in the totally. background. This kid runs out and <laughs> <laughs> like that was, and, but do it, it's good money. And like, I'm like I, that's why I said yes. And yeah. also cause I didn't have anything else to do and it helped me to, to hone my craft. But, uh, now I would not do a bar mitzvah intro video. I right. feel like I've gotten to a point. Of course. I'm, I'm not against going back yeah, to that. I don't want you to say that cause you never know. <laughs> what if you get some huge bar mitzvah opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. There are some artistic 13 year old you know, yeah. kid out there who has like some incredible vision. He's like, this is going to be like a Sundance hit. It's yeah, my yeah, yeah. And they can let me execute as Absolutely. well on yeah. my creativity. <laughs> yeah, of course. You never um, know. That's fun. So, so yeah, let's then let's go back and, and talk about kind of those early days for you. Yeah. When did you first start to start to get interested in comedy? Yeah. Well, the first time I uh, did stand up was actually I was, so I started as doing stand up. And the first time I did it was right before I graduated high school. I had heard about open mics. And I really wanted to do it. I grew up like an hour from New York and I researched one was at the comic strip in New York. And so I like a few months out, like booked to do it and came down and I was like pet, like so nervous. And, uh, I actually, I barfed in the bathroom at <laughs> no, the comic didn't. strip. Yeah, I really did. My friend, I went with a friend and we were both going to do it for the first time. He went up and he was doing like, okay. And then I was watching people go up and all do really having, it was, you know, if you've never been to an open mic before, it's a weird experience. I mean, it's, you, you have a vision of it and then you go and it's like, oh, it's quiet. Most people aren't getting any laughs. So I was like, oh, that's going to be me. This is going to be the worst thing that's ever happened. So I <laughs> yeah. actually left during my friend's set. I didn't even see it because I just went and puked in the oh, bathroom. Wow. So I barfed. And then, uh, then they actually, I guess while I was puking, they skip my name so then i got back and it was like 30 people at this mic and i remember uh the woman was hosting it. it was this really nice lady named gladys and she uh she was like okay we have one person left and then she called someone who wasn't me oh no so i was like oh shit so then i had to go and be like oh you think you forgot me so then that guy finished and then she got back up and she's like there's actually one more and the whole audience went oh it was like a collective <laughs> groan and then oh, i was like still could taste like barf in my mouth and i went up so i blacked out and then i was like i don't think i'm ever gonna do this again oh. but but then it was like one of those things where, you know, once that was so horrifying, I was like, well, I got to try it again when I'm a little less freaked out. And so then I did it a few more times and then um, sort of like in and out, I was really enjoyed the idea of it yeah. rather than the performing of it at that time. And then uh, when I got to college, I started doing it a lot more where we met in Philly. And yeah. then uh, and that's where I started my senior year of college. I was like, okay. Oh, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to really try to do this. I've started doing stand up instead of doing it like once every couple of months and making it a hobby. I was like, I'm going to really do it. And so I started to do all the mics every week that year and then moved to New York after that year, essentially. I think there is something about stand up that kind of, uh, it, it kind of draws you back in, especially when you first get a taste and you first do it. Yeah. Um, were you writing for a long time before you, you did it? Yeah. Yeah. I was like writing down a bunch of probably like a year and a half of just like yeah. things jotted down. I did the same thing. Yeah. It was like, cause I love the Comedy Central presents. I would always watch mm -hmm. those. And I remember there were these one night stands that came out on HBO. It was like Patrice O'Neill, Bill Burr and Louis CK. And I had never heard of any of them at that point. And so I was like, 16 17 and i watched those and i was like these were like i thought it was like incredible and yeah. so cool and then uh so then i wrote all these things they were probably i mean they're i i know they were really horrible and i did them to an audience of uh people who probably didn't enjoy them <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then uh but then uh yeah it was just sort of the repetition of doing it it's like you get more comfortable with it and you have more fun with it yeah, it's uh, it's funny that I was I just had Nathan Jaiola on the okay, show. Okay, awesome. Um, a couple weeks ago, because his, his story is funny because he did comedy in Philly, right? And then 
then he instead of going to New York like most Philly comedians, he went to Vietnam <laughs> and Cambodia. Oh man, that's great! I didn't yeah. even know that. Yeah, so he he basically made that. Uh, well, he didn't go over just for the comedy. <laughs> okay, no, okay. <laughs> I don't think many people go to <laughs> Cambodia. For, like this is how I'm going to make my big break. Yeah, of course. Uh, but he went over to do one of those teaching things where you, okay. you're teaching right, right, students right. English. And then he saw like a flyer, heard somebody talking about stand up comedy, and he's like, "Oh, okay." And yeah. then it just somehow pulled him back into it. It's um, hard to quit. I mean, it yeah. is like a thing that I feel like whenever I picture like not doing it, I would still, I'm like, oh, it's like, well, if I wasn't doing stamp, then I would have more time to think about stand up. It's like a weird thing. It's like, it's like, <laughs> I, if I, was, I would write more or yeah. something, you know, it's like, uh, it's sort of like built in. You were always jotting stuff down. It's, it is really fun. Getting a new joke to work is like still like the most exhilarating feeling yeah. because it's like, you know, you write it, jokes and it's like when but when you have a new one and it hits that first time you're like oh i i got one to work again that's like it's i find that so inspiring because it's like this feeling of like taking literally something that you just jotted in your phone and then you said it and people laughed and then you feel like okay i'm still funny something yeah <laughs> sometimes that's how it starts i think is that it, it starts in just conversation with people you tell somebody a story about yeah. yourself and you get this reaction yeah and you're like oh i that's cool. I like, like that reaction. Yeah, totally. Like I, I said something funny. And like yeah. for me, I feel like I have a good sense of humor, but growing up, I was never the, there's some people that are just hilarious of that course. are naturally funny. Yeah. And that wasn't me. I feel like I could have detected it. And then yeah. every once in a while I would say something funny yeah, and then I'm yeah. like, cool, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was me too. And I, I did it. I, I wrote for like a year, year before and a half. Before you even did it. Before I ever did yeah. stand up. It was just, I filled up a journal with jokes. I, and that's one of the things it's like for people who are just starting out in any of these these fields yeah keep the the, the old stuff because yeah imagine do you still have some of the old notebooks I, uh, yeah i have all of them I've, uh -huh. I've never thrown them away some but of them i go i actually will look back at them sometimes because sometimes you'll find like uh especially if you wrote something down when you were like 20 or 21 and it's about something in that time period the specifics in that story that you wrote down are so much better than if you were to like Oh, I'm going to write a scene where it's like a 20 year old in this oh, feeling. But sometimes yeah. those specifics that you have, like even just like if you if it was like a small thing that you wouldn't even remember about your dorm or if it was like a small thing that the way you would talk in college, it, a lot of that stuff, I find that my personality was the same back then, but sort of like the point of view on certain things has evolved because as you get older, but the purity of those thoughts are still like, there's something really like, sort of ignorant to like what life really is but is really how a 20 year old would view the world or something like that yeah that's so true it actually reminds me of i know you used to do some like writing for college humor yeah yeah i remember one like article that you wrote on like i think it was finding places to masturbate <laughs> yeah. like yeah. like things that you wouldn't write about now or even think about now totally yeah it was like that was like i was like oh this is like my opus you know <laughs> yeah, i was this like is it. this yeah, is my shot i remember i, I there was a person there who helped me draw cartoons that would compliment it i was like this is gonna <laughs> be like a, a and that was really fun like I got to intern there so they would let you write these articles and like putting stuff out there like that was cool because it was a way to like to actually put work out in a way it would get seen by like yeah, lots unreal. of people but it was like uh but yeah it was like that's not something I would 100% make right the second but it's something that you know in the right context would maybe make sense for a character to think of or something like that. right so you so I guess give me some perspective to uh, we met during this comedy competition. Yeah. Yeah. I had a really good shtick at the time where I wore like an ugly sweater and, <laughs> and right. played, you guitar. played guitar. Yeah, yeah no, you did. were good. I yeah. remember that competition. It, Nathan was in that too. Yeah, Nathan it? was in it. And then we had a couple other people yeah. from, from Philly. In right, it. right. Yeah. Um, and then on your team, I remember it was you and then David Adjacope. Yeah. Adjacom. Adjacom. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, he's still, he's in New York. Yeah. He's in New York doing now. stand up. Yeah. He's really funny. Yeah. So what, where does it go from there? And like, what are, was there, you know, people talk about big breaks and obviously sure. people think, I think people have a misunderstanding of what a big break is <laughs> right. yeah, sure. and what it will do for your career. Right. But I guess instead of saying big break, what were some of the early like exciting opportunities that you had? Well, it was like, um, so I was doing it there in that year I started to do after we did that around the time we did that competition, probably I started to do like the open mics at the Raven lounge and stuff like that, which were really like a great place to go. It was like a sense of first time having like a sense of comedy community outside of college and stuff like that. And like seeing the other comics in Philly and like just really actually pursuing it. And so from there, 
I started to get like a couple of random opening opportunities that would come out of that. Like at Helium was the comedy club there. Mm -hmm. So I remember actually like the big, a big moment was like, there was a three minute and a five minute list at the open mic at Helium. Yeah. And one day I got on the five minute oh, list shit. and that was like legitimately <laughs> like, I could have cried. I was so <laughs> really? happy. That's yeah, amazing. It was like a big deal. Because it, 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 there was this sense of, I mean, for us coming into the, the Philly comedy scene, there are, were the comedians that just seemed like they were always there and that were really sharp and yeah, really great. And yeah. they all got the five minutes. Right. And it was yeah. like, these are the vets, <laughs> yeah, the veterans no. of the game. And they were the hosts at the club and stuff like that. So then, um, so an early thing was getting to host at Helium right after I graduated college. That was like a really, for me, you know, it was a really like meaningful thing. And then, um, so I was doing stamp there. I had had a good opportunity in that a, um, a manager for comedy had come who had, I was doing stamp in this comedy group at college and he had founded it like years previous. Mm -hmm. And so he came to see a show at our college and saw me there and he was like, Oh, you know, you could do this professionally. I think if you really like focused on it, which was like a good encouragement. And I was always very hesitant to really go there, but he mm -hmm. was somebody who I would like email for advice and stuff. And so when I decided to like really do it, um, we started to work together when I moved to New York and he helped me with like a couple of early opportunities. Like he got me on a, a, it was like this competition thing at Caroline's. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did pretty good in that. And then I started to get some spots at Caroline's, which was sort of in that same vibe of like the helium thing where it was like, Oh, okay. So I only have one show this month, but it felt like I had a, sh like a show that I could go do while I was doing open mics and stuff. Um, so those were like early things that like gave me some hope of doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there I got, uh, an audition for Comedy Central's comics to watch, which is like this stand-up showcase for the New York comedy festival. And, uh, that went well. And then I got on that list, um, which was like, I felt like a really good accomplishment and then had a couple of small random, I hadn't like set out to be an actor necessarily, but I would mm -hmm. get these auditions sometimes from stand up. Um, and so I got like a one line part in Louie was my first thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it that must have been exciting. It oh, was, got it got cut. Yeah. It was, oh, we did, Cause I, I remember watching it and I, I think I heard about that you were going to be on the show and yeah. then I watched it. I don't think I saw you. In I it was like, so that was like really exciting. I was like, it was like a random audition. I was like, oh man, I got it. Like a part in this, like literally at the time, it, like, I couldn't even fathom something like that. And yeah. I was like, this is so cool. It was one of my favorite shows. And it was uh, like one line and I got the call. I was like, this is, and then I was in it. I was like, I didn't understand how things work with that. Like yeah. it was like, it was a, like a line at the end of a scene. It didn't have a lot of like value necessarily to the scene. Um, or maybe I did it horribly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I remember like I wasn't in it and like uh, my grandpa is like you can't see or hear that great he's not the like you know he's older dude but he uh he called everyone else knew that i was cut but my name was still in the credits and i think he assumed that i must have still been in it and he saw me and he called him or like sent me a text or email being like you were incredible <laughs> that was, i literally wasn't in it. you weren't even in it so that was like a, a moment of like you know you talk about these things at the time i was like okay well that's the end you know probably <laughs> For your career your yeah. acting career it it's was like, like i tried i was like oh man this is i'm I must have been so bad that they had to be like, this line can't possibly be in this thing. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you think there's the worst case scenario. Totally. So those were like, that was like my first couple of years in New York was like doing open mics, the Comedy Central uh, comics to watch and that one line. And then I got like this little part also in, um, in uh, I Just Want My Pants Back, which was like an MTV sitcom for a season. Mm -hmm. And so there were these, there was lots of like, I mean, really the drive was to like do stand up, come up with ideas. And then I would take sort of what we were saying, just saying yes to like any audition that anybody would have me at, I would go do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so those were like the earliest stuff that I did. Um, and then sort of the goal for, I think a lot of like people when they start at Mike's, my goal was to like do the Montreal comedy festival, like to do new faces there. And so I was trying to do that and then got that maybe a couple years after I moved to New York, maybe two or three years or so. That was kind of like the peak for you. or at least Yeah, that, that was like that... what my goal was as like when I moved to New York, I was like, I want to try and do that festival. Yeah. And then, um, so that was the, you know, that was sort of just going to open mics, working on what that six minute set would be and waiting for the auditions to roll around. And 
in between all this. So these are kind of like the, the big peaks yeah, that are yeah, through it. Yeah. But then like in, in the valleys, <laughs> right. it's just a lot of stand-up, a lot of writing, yeah, a lot just, of open mics. Yeah, it was just pure like open mics every day. And then meeting, like moving to New York, it was like meeting a whole group of new comedians. Like the open mics at the time where there was this one called The Woodshed that was really like considered like the hardest mic. It was really great. Like the people there were really funny. Some of them had already done stand up on TV and stuff like that. It was mm-hmm. really strong. Um, that Dan St. Germain and Mike Lawrence hosted that was on Saturdays. And then the pit on Tuesdays that Jay Welch hosts, um, which was really like another place where everybody would go and you would just try and keep up and have a good set at those. Mm-hmm. And so that was really, it, it was but it was that same feeling of trying to get that new joke to work every night and just sort of feeling like you're building just your own growth comedically because the, you know, the actual stuff that you would be capable of booking or somebody be willing to give you doesn't completely all exist at that point. You're really just trying to cultivate as much stuff as you could have. So if someone ever was like, oh, I do you have an idea, you have something. Or if someone's like, hey, come do come open for me and do 15 minutes. You have those 15 minutes or something. You have to be ready for it. You have to work your ass off. So then once you get lucky, you're right. ready for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the big thing here is that you kind of, you have this, this goal or at least, uh, you know, the direction where you want to go. Right. Cause they're there in terms of like the self development world, there's some people, there's Leo Babauta who will say that, uh, you don't need goals to actually achieve anything. You can, if, if you just focus on your work and you enjoy what you're doing right now, that's all that matters. Yeah. Then there's other people like Tim Ferriss who are goals are the most important thing that you can set in terms of understanding where you want to go. Um, but no matter what, either two of those paths you take, what's most important is that you're, you're just focusing on the work that you're doing and you're totally. like, you're just crafting each of those jokes and you're just trying, right. it's a very micro view of it. You're not, each time you go do stand up, you're not thinking big picture necessarily, right? You're thinking yeah. about this five minutes. Yeah. Th- that and trying to always come up with jokes that you're like, Oh, this is really funny to me and feels like very personal to me. That was sort of the way that I went about it was always like just in still do to this day is always trying to like figure out like what is a joke that would be something that I really care about and really want to say and something that I'm really excited to tell that feels personal to me and feels like you know obviously it's like everybody has some something that they you know unique to them but trying to figure out what's the most unique thing that you could say that's personal to you um and sometimes you succeed at that, sometimes you don't, but it's like you try and, you know, that sort of micro goal. But in the bigger picture, I knew like I had done screenwriting in college and I knew I wanted to write, like screenwrite and write for TV and write for movies and stuff like that were like those big goals like that you're talking about. Like, so I knew in the distance there was these things I would really like to do and still would like to do. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so starting out was like knowing that those existed, but taking these very micro step of like, well, if I get good stand up, then someone might ask me to do this or someone might ask me to do that. And just having some level of hope that that would happen. Right. But, uh, but I think a lot of it too is just surrounding yourself with like funny people and meeting people and like the comedians and that I met early in New York, some of them were so good or, or even were just new and just naturally so good and sharp, um, that, you know, it motivates you to get better at it. when did you meet Kevin Barnett? I met Kevin, uh, like he had been living here maybe a year. I met him like a few months living here and then started to do stand up a lot together and got a lot of our random first little writing jobs at the same time and then we worked together on friends of the people and then have gone on to work together a lot since then Mm -hmm. Um, did you guys like become friends right away yeah we we became friends uh like pretty quickly we were both about the same age and had similar sort of we were just sort of doing like working in similar places or doing stand up in similar spots and then a lot of like literally the first random uh first like mtv2 writing job day job it was like the two of us and then mm-hmm. it was we went on the road a lot together um early on and so just yeah ended up just being around each other a lot and then found that we liked working together a lot too um and then you guys end up doing friends of the people yeah so that that, that that must be insane you guys literally had like a billboard with your faces on it in <laughs> yeah, times square yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> i forget that that was real yeah that's so bizarre uh, yeah so that was like something that came out of like 
a lot of people. So that was seven people on that show all, who all created it or and all were executive producers and writers on it. Um, and that came out of essentially like partly doing Montreal. Also, um, some friends, Jermaine Fowler, Will Rell Howery, who I didn't know at that, this point, and mm-hmm. Jen Bartels um, had done. There was like an In Living Color reboot that didn't go forward that they had done. And then when we were all at Montreal doing New Faces, um, we were like talking about, we had been talking about doing a sketch show together and then had put together a pitch together um, that was Kevin, uh, in addition to those three, myself, Kevin, and uh, the Lucas Brothers. And then we did that for, everybody was a writer on that. We did that for two two, two seasons. Um, ended up being two seasons on True. And that's got to be like, pretty high achievement like kind of yeah i think that's what a lot of people when they get into comedy uh and when you start writing you're trying to figure out a show to get a show picked up is pretty damn big yeah it was cool we it went through a couple of like processes it was like a lot it took like from the probably the day that you pitch it to i'm trying to even think like i'm trying to think of dates it's probably like from the day that you pitch it to the day that it was actually on tv was like a year and a half you know it's like it takes a long time for those things Mm -hmm. so i think like you know, I don't know if people have an assumption that it would happen really fast, but it takes takes a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was like really cool. It was like a great way to like make a bunch of stuff and feel like, you know, it was definitely like a, a, a great way to feel like you were building towards doing other stuff and everyone's gone on to do really cool things from it. And um, what, what were some of the things that you, you learned about working on? Was that your first like long term project like yeah, that where definitely. you're writing and you're acting and you're doing all this stuff? What are some of the things that you learn? Like what worked and what didn't? Um, um, it's a variety of stuff. So it's like you, I think that it, a lot of it, I think, is sometimes confirming certain instincts. It's like if some, if everyone's really excited about a certain idea, even if it's not fully cracking right away, it's worth staying on that one because like very anything that somebody has like a real personal connection to, once you find what it is or how to write it, it's always going to be some of the best work as opposed to something that maybe instantly is just funny. That can be really great too. But I think at least when we were figuring out sketches, my favorite ones always tended to like come from somebody who had like a really specific personal connection to what they were pitching. Mm -hmm. Um, And then with filming and writing, it was always like, you know, the best stuff tends to be where that person who's driving it has like, you know, their vision for it comes through in the sketch. You know what I mean? It's like, they're like, even if it's a small thing, they're like, Oh, the shirt has to be red because of this reason. Like those, those end (laughs) up being like, those always end up being so funny because you can tell how much they care about it. I think if one thing I would draw out of this and from all the things, it's like the more somebody, you know, when they really have a vision for what they want something to feel like, and it's someone that you believe in that always ends up being like, I feel like the best work or the best sketches we made on the show and stuff like that. So uh, what advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out? And uh, cause I think it's, it's, it's kind of difficult because I mean, everybody's looking for like a life hack for, for right, everything. Of course, and like, yeah. you can't life hack, I think comedy being successful in yeah, comedy yeah. And, 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 um, the hard work that is required out of it. But yeah. at the same time, you have thousands of people likely in New York that are aspiring stand-up comedians right. that are trying to kind of make a name for themselves. Um, can they do anything out? Is it like worthwhile for, I mean, everybody comedian's got a podcast now too. Right, of course. So it's like, yeah. how do you, I like mean, what advice would you give somebody who doesn't know? What I, to I feel do? like the truth is that I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's like a weird yeah. thing to say, but I really don't know. Like uh, to say like, Oh, this is how you succeed at comedy. Like I'm, somebody who's I've, I've gotten to do a lot of things I hope to do. And I have a lot of things I would hope to do that. I hope I get a chance to do. It's always like, you're always building towards something. Yeah. Um, so like the broad strokes advice I think is, you know, it depends what you're trying to do in comedy, but I think writing, like making things like if you're, if you're in a place where you're like, well, I don't, if if you're doing stand up you should be doing stand up as much as you can and meeting other comedians and building that community of people you know and then also just making sure you're doing jokes that you like and not that you're just like hoping people would like or something like that you know yeah. just like even if it takes a little while to find your footing with it like to really tap into what you think is funny and hopefully people connect to it and then the um you know if you have an idea for something find people if 
if you can't shoot it and you can't make it, try and find somebody who knows how to do that and see if they're down to help you with it and just really push through and make it. And even if it comes out terrible, you tried or something like that. I think. Is that some of the sketches that we worked on early on? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. made some. Yeah, those were like early. <laughs> You're like, yeah. I'm not showing these to anybody. Yeah, but that was <laughs> that was only due to, to me and to... I, oh, those were me and Kevin. Yeah, that, your you work and, was flawless on those. Of it was course, just obviously. Yeah, no. Um, there was the Just Friends one. Yeah, yeah, that was really then, fun. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Had, that, that one had some good parts in it. But I was just... I think also at that point, I was just speaking to like the self-consciousness I felt at the uh, comic strip you know, that was a few years after that, but like, right. I was always so nervous about, I wanted everything to be perfect. perfect. Yeah. Exactly. And there is like an expectation with stand up, which is nice, which is like, it can't be perfect when you go do an open mic and there's an expectation it won't be. Mm -hmm. But with those things, those first things I filmed, I was like, if this wasn't a full out masterpiece, I was like, I don't want to put it out. I'll be like, everyone's yeah. going to think it's terrible. But stand up's also iterative. So it's like, if it doesn't work tonight, you can switch it up tomorrow. Totally. Or you can literally do three open mic nights in, in one night to Correct. craft something and yeah. make sure it's better. When you put something on the internet, and this is actually why I, I don't think many comedians and comedians are hesitant to put their work online, especially a stand up set. Oh, yeah. Because it's always a work in progress. Completely. Yeah. I, I really have hesitated to have much online i've never participated too much in putting stuff online um until i was like working on stuff that would get, go online in general like sketches from the show or mm -hmm. things in general but yeah i was always very protective of like not putting anything out there in a larger sense other than the 20 people were there until i was like truly truly proud of it yeah but I, I, think I think that can work for different people like some people like that just is me it's more like a personal comfort thing but some people just put stuff out and it can be really great. I've seen people who like start at Twitter and they just put out like 20 <laughs> tweets a day and they're all kind of not great. But then yeah. they get really good at it because yeah. they just did it and they were just through caution to the wind. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's something that I would recommend. I think with stand up, it's a little bit different um, in terms of like putting your actual sets online. But with the sketch stuff, uh, I felt that same apprehension in even doing this podcast yeah. because I have never up until this point. Um, besides like a couple YouTube videos, I'd never done anything where it's like me putting myself out there, which yeah. is like, it's just, it's just terrifying. Like yeah, I, I have like, panic attacks. Like yeah. I can't do this. I can't like yeah. somebody please help me out here <laughs> yeah, and tell no. me that this is the right thing to do. Right. I just need like encouragement and pats on the back. Yeah, no, it's a real leap of faith. It's like, but I think that's like kind of what you have to do to some extent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think you have to just put your stuff out there. It worked out for you anyway, though. You didn't, did you put out many sketches, like independent stuff? I know no. you've done some short films, but I did. Yeah. Eventually I put out a short film that was like, sort of like a thing that I, I knew I'd always want to make movies like as I was like doing Samp and stuff like that. And so I, but I wasn't a director and didn't know how to do it or anything like that. So it was always like uh, a thing where I was like, Oh, if I, you know, at some point if I had enough money to fund something. And then as I started to see people make stuff, friends of mine, I was like, Oh, sometimes it doesn't take a million dollars to make something. If you have enough people willing to do you a favor who are willing to shoot this or yeah. do this. Um, so it was like actually right when friends of the people got picked up, I had had this script. It was like a 20 minute movie, um, that I really wanted to make. And I had met this guy who was like down to do it. And I really liked his work. He had sent me a short film of his at one point, And I was like, thought it was very similar aesthetically to what I would want to make. So when friends of the people got picked up, I was like, okay, I'm going to use some of this money towards shooting this. So it was like, right as we started the writer's room, I shot the short film on like four different days of the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and on this favor of these two directors who I really like, Matt Porter and Matt Kasman, and they um, brought in friends of theirs who were like r incredible what they do. There's a DP named Ryan um, who was just awesome and has gone through a bunch of stuff for Vice and stuff. And mm -hmm. so they were just all down to do this on very limited budget um, yeah, or time. Like no and then, money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that was sort of like a, a leap of faith thing that I was like, I didn't know how it would come out, but I had seen them make movies of similar length and they were good. So I put a lot of trust in them and we just made it. And it was just, a, that was like one of the most satisfying experiences was just this short film that I made that, yeah. it, you know, I got into a couple of film festivals with it and then put it out on Vimeo had really liked it and made it like a staff pick. So it got seen oh, no a way. pretty good amount. What's it called? It was called Hasta La Vista. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just like, uh, that was like a, a story that came out of a stand up bit that I wanted to convey in like a 20 minute movie. And that was, it was really, it was really fun to make. That was like a literally 
a nut like no budget four or five days of shooting and is that really all it was four or five days for a 20 minute yeah that's, that's a lot of work in a short yeah, period of yeah, time yeah. so and a lot of locations there was a lot of also like you know sneaking into places or oh, shooting yeah. on the subway as it's moving and almost you know Ryan almost died a couple times. Oh, really? Yeah, it was oh, like, because it would like turn and we we're like trying to do all these shots, having friends, actors come and do stuff. Um, Dan St. Germain played a part in it. He played a, a homeless guy in it and he had to like sing in front of all these people. But it was like real people and we oh, had God. to do it a couple times because like the camera, we would hit us up and he was just like, God damn it, please don't make me embarrass myself. <laughs> no, I don't want to do this again. And just doing it as like, but he was just doing it as a friend and it was just so appreciative. Yeah. Uh, I was just so appreciative that he would uh, do it and all my friends who were in it would come and do it. And well, that's that, the thing. I think sometimes I have this idea that people are only motivated by money. And then I have to pay people for a project that, that may, I'm not getting paid for myself or right. it's a passion project of my own. And the truth is that a lot of people just want to be a part of something uh, that they believe in. And if you believe in something enough, you can inspire other people to want to. Totally. And I think that's sort of like sometimes I early on would wait for somebody to affirm something that I wanted to do. I'd be like, well, I have to run this by a like a hundred people to make sure they think this is a good idea. But eventually it's like, if you have something you're really excited about, you get the advice of some people that you respect who could be like, you know, your friends. I think it's always important to keep friends who are honest with you, who could be like, listen, man, that is a, one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you're like, no, it's not. And then they explain to you why. And you're like, okay, actually, that's a great point. It is yeah, a terrible you idea. You sleep on it. I think sometimes yeah, you just yeah, need yeah, a couple yeah, days totally. to come back to it. Yeah, of course. And then there's other times where you're just like, you know, if you if those couple of people that you run it by or even just in yourself, you're like, I know this. I feel like this would be good. You have to take a shot on it. And maybe it'll be terrible. I have no idea. But yeah. but at least then you'll know that it was a bad idea. It's, but I think sometimes the most frustrated I feel is when I have a bunch of ideas on my computer where I'm like, oh, man, I should finish this. And I haven't. But sometimes when you just do it, you feel a lot better. Yeah. And you I, find and you learn when you do it, too. Yeah. I think it's easier when you uh, it's less stress and less pressure when you're working on a project that's just a passion project and there's no money involved. Yeah, of course. <laughs> when you have people funding projects and it's like there's producers there and the clients there and totally. you're like, actually, a, I, have, I have almost like a different I have felt more nervous on the uh, passion project thing because I was like, no one's making aim. If this is terrible, everyone just wasted their time. I was like starting to feel, I was like, I was, I was just like, <laughs> right, this is going to be really embarrassing for them. And then I have to like, I kept picturing having to email everyone eventually and be like, look, this just is horrible. I made a huge mistake. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You're never going to see yeah, it. Yeah. I'd like send people like an Amazon gift certificate as a condole, like as a consolation. I'm like, I'm so sorry that this is terrible. Yeah. Take everybody out the coffee individually. Yeah. And those things like the things where you're being funded to do it. There's a pressure there that exists too. But I think there's, at least I've felt more like, okay, this is, I, I've, I've, somebody gave me good advice once uh, where it was like, when you get those things, if you feel comfortable doing them, you know, you don't have to be, if you're, if you're ever like, holy shit, I can't believe this is happening. It's usually a bad, <laughs> like a bad <laughs> moment. You're like, but when you get something and you're like, okay, yeah, I think I know what to do here. But I think all those experiences of making the short film, doing these random things all like make it so that when you get a real opportunity that you're getting paid for and finance you're like oh, okay well i'm just they gave this to you because it's something that you did well mm -hmm. don't change who you are how you go about making your work um just do that again but it's just in a different place yeah know? i think it takes actually which is hard to do too it's like yeah. all these things are like really easy. It's like, stay true to yourself it's like that's fucking impossible but yeah. it's like but but yeah but i think you have to do that i think you learn that stuff through experience too and it's like you said the more you do it the more confidence you get in it right but still to this day like if i land a big client project um and and it say it's a, a, a bigger budget than i expected I'm like, well, shit. Am I actually like ready for? Can yeah, I actually course. do yeah. this. Yeah, am I, I worth that? I don't I think that I. I don't think I'm actually gonna make something that's good. Yeah. But then it's like, I think you have doubts before any project like that. Oh, and of anytime course. you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone or doing something you haven't done before. Yeah. No, it, it's exactly that. You just kind of go in a little bit. You're flying a little bit blind. You just have to be like, well, I believe that I could do this. And I think a lot of it too is just like watching stuff and being like, well, I'm gonna. I, I always felt like I'm never going to quit doing this. So I have to just take these things because right. I'm going to not stop doing this. So it'd be weird to never stop, but also be afraid to take an opportunity. So it's like you just do it because you're just like, OK, well, if this goes terrible, I'll just try again. Like it just is that sort of feeling. And that's sort of what doing stand up early on is it's like 
every night it would be up and down of how well you did and if a new joke worker didn't. But like, uh, I think that feeling has always just been true. I'm just like, even if something went horribly, I'm like, well, I would just try another thing. And if something right. goes well, I'm just going to try another thing. So <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to either eventually succeed or just have wasted my entire life. <laughs> there's like really kind of, big failure. there's kind of two like roads, but I'm already pretty far down the road of like, I'm just going to keep doing this. So I, uh, you know, so hopefully it works out. And if it doesn't, then it's like, okay, well, I, you know, it didn't work out. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel. I forget. Who, I think maybe I was talking about this with Nate, but I was like, if I ever gave like a motivational speech, yeah. it would finish with, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Cause I really don't know. Like you, I could, you know, we could all listen to this in 20 years and be like oh man that was he really that was horrible yeah, that's really, why he stuck with it all these years and even though it wasn't working yeah it wasn't working <laughs> he was and so it committed was, yeah like you don't want to be that person who inspires people with how you continue to go on despite <laughs> it ever seeming like a good idea but that is like i think you have to go into it with the you have to go into it understanding that it may just not work out i think yeah. that still going full throttling because i think it's really hard to do these things when you have one foot in and one foot out like the sooner that you're just like, all right, I'm going for it. Even though I'm terrified and I barfed in a bathroom, I'm just going to go for it and I'll either succeed or I won't. But I, you know, you have to just like take that leap because otherwise it's, I feel like I get more done when I'm just like, all right, I really believe in this. I'm going to go for it. And uh, rather than when I'm like, well, I don't know. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of attention today with the self-development, self-help world focusing on the positive you've got the secret have you heard of the secret i've heard of it i haven't read i i i haven't read a lot of those things. i don't i don't yeah okay good i think i've i think i watched the movie okay. and then just halfway through like rolling my eyes because it's like it, it's an extreme point of view in terms of the the positive thinking stuff where they're basically saying that if you think positively about getting a parking spot when you come home the parking spot will appear <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay. literally like that's like okay that's obviously not, not true contr- right, that's yeah. insane that's never happened, um, but I think there's probably an aspect to positive thinking and being positive yeah. about outcomes that is helpful but at the same time what I think people ignore is just imagining the absolute worst case oh, scenario that's, that's my favorite <laughs> yeah. yeah like that's my entire life and that's what I do with every <laughs> single thing yeah um, is that worst case scenario and then you realize that it, it, it's really not going to get that bad well that's almost like the good part of uh Stand up is like when you've done stand up, you have bombed in a way that you left feeling like you embarrassed yourself in like a public way that you can't even like comprehend. Like you don't even want to. I've had sets like that where I leave being like, oh, my God, I hope I never see anyone there again. (laughs) Those people think I'm a fool. And it just so you have this feeling of like bottoming out. So when you do it again and it goes well, you're like, okay, I've had the experience of standing in a place in a cafeteria and no one listening to me and embarrassing myself completely and then so all this other stuff it's like you have to kind of go into it being like well there's a world where this is the worst thing that's ever been made Mm -hmm. like i always picture there's uh there's that famous movie that uh what's his face made that he refuses to release he plays like a clown in the holocaust what's the name of it He's like he, one of the most famous comedians of all time. Yeah. So it's embarrassing not to remember it. Is but he it, old school or like a newer? Old school. And he re- didn't let it be released. So that yeah. was like, a f- I always thought that story was so interesting. It stuck with me as a kid mm-hmm. because I was like, you know, that you could have something that you just wouldn't want anyone to ever see, even at the height of success. Um, and maybe it was, I think it might be Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis, yeah. And so I was like, uh, if it's wrong, then I'm wrong. And we'll know. edit it out and I'll dub It's always my weird to so say how this has like been an impactful story and then you can't remember the name of the person. <laughs> yeah, yet. like did you head into that story you're like, fuck, I'm going to screw this up. <laughs> yeah, as I started, I regretted it, but you can leave it in. You yeah, know, but see, this happen. is an experience. This is a, be an example of failing. Small failures. <laughs> yeah, of like, course. Life is built on these small failures. But just that idea, it's like uh, people make, I, when I watch stuff all the time, like very, how often do you actually see a movie and you're like, that was the greatest movie I've ever seen. It's very rare. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like people put out a lot of stuff and some of it's really good and some of it maybe isn't for you or is good to other people. And it's like, you just have to go for it because nobody knows, nobody has any idea what it, it you know, people have, you listen to people who you respect. Some of these friends of mine who haven't made a lot of stuff, but just have really great taste or really good integrity can give you the best advice even then over people who have made a million things. It can be, you know, I think a balance of like, having those instincts and listening to people with 
lots of experience give you advice. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like you just kind of have to do what you want because I I don't know what I, I don't know what I would tell somebody to you know how to do stuff necessarily other than work hard and make things that you genuinely like. When do you know when to to take risks and then maybe it's like telling a joke that's a little bit maybe risky <laughs> right. or or working on a project that you're like ah eh, I'm probably crossing the line here. Uh, yeah, I guess it's. It varies. I feel like stand up is an easy way to find out with that stuff because you get sort of that immediate reaction. I feel like with when you're writing a movie script or something like that, it takes so many, it takes so long that you want to feel pretty committed to the idea and not have too many doubts about it. Um, but I don't know. I feel like my opinion on that stuff is always like if you, regardless of what it is, even if you're worried it might irritate somebody or offend somebody if it's something that you really like you should just do it and then because either way somebody no matter what you make somebody's gonna hate it and somebody's gonna like it it's very rare that anyone makes anything that is universally loved mm -hmm. so it's like you know i think going into it with a healthy idea of like oh there is a world where somebody's gonna say that they hate this and being okay with that i think is probably the most important thing you can do because that's going to happen no matter what. Even if you yeah. shirk the thing that you thought would be the thing that they'd hate, they'll hate something. There's no way to, you have to just accept that. Like it, the idea that you would ever make anything and expect that everyone will love it is like too naive. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. But I think, I think you're a great example because you are like one of the nicest people that I know. Oh, like I, I feel like you're, you're just a, a very genuine person and you always want the best for other people. But, uh, so you start putting stuff out there <laughs> And then, like, you put enough content, enough yeah. work out there that there are a lot of people that have probably just, like, said really mean things about you online. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I don't, like... You don't look at it? I mean, there's probably comments on, like, videos that are, like, this sucks or whatever. Yeah. And you're just like... But if there's also a bunch of comments that are, like, this is good. And you're just like, that's fine, you know? It also, it's like... I don't know. It's like... It is sort of just that acceptance of, like, not everybody's going to like everything. It's just a weird feeling to have. But I think it's important <laughs> to know that, like... Even, like, I, I remember a experience. I went to see Fish in the Dark, which was Larry David's play. Okay. And I remember I was in the lobby afterwards. And Larry David's, like, one of my favorite com writers, comedians ever. Like, I love Kirby Enthusiasm and Seinfeld are, you know, two of my favorite, if not my favorite shows. And so we're staying in the lobby, and I remember hearing a lady turn to her friend, and it was at intermission. And she was like, yeah, it's, you know, it's Larry Davidy, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's okay. And she was like, yeah, it's okay. And I was just like, even Larry David, people are going to be like, yeah, it's fine. And it's yeah. like, he's the great, he's one of the greatest comedians of all time. And think what you want about the play, it's fine. But I, I've met people who hate Curb Your Enthusiasm. They uh, say it's the worst show of all time. And to me, it's the greatest show of all time. Yeah. I've met people who don't, I want, remember showing Seinfeld to a friend in college and they didn't get it. And I'm just like, well, if there's someone out there who's not going to get that, then who am I to be like, oh, man, this guy thought this video I made sucked. It's right. Like, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. If Larry David can't make everyone happy. Yeah, of course. It's like, so I think you just have to be cool with that. And even if you put out something that's truly horrible, there's so many stories of people you can. I used to read people's Wikipedias, comedian Wikipedias or writer Wikipedias. So often it's very rare that anyone has a, uh, a perf is thrown a perfect game where everything they've ever made was something that they were proud of or good with you know what i mean it's like everybody, everybody everybody's got a pooty tang somewhere everybody, everybody's got something so yeah. it's like I, I don't know i don't fear it too much and then i'm like well if i made the worst thing of all time then i would just have to not do comedy anymore which would suck and that yeah. would just you know, <laughs> but i would probably that still make stuff i would still make other things maybe it would be liberating It'd yeah be like, the next thing everyone be like well he made the worst thing of all time so this next thing actually was not that bad it was <laughs> yeah. like a better you yeah know? it was better or worse yeah uh, thing but I, that's what i think is so funny about creating putting your heart and soul into something working so hard on something and then somebody's just like eh. yeah yeah i know eh, it was all right yeah it was no, all right. and then you just have to be cool with that you know well I, I yeah that's like, i mean if you just get a bunch if anybody thinks that what you did is amazing that's pretty cool if you get one really person is, yeah. that's pretty that's that's a lot i don't know i mean you know we're all you have to be somewhat i guess narcissistic to do any of this that you think your ideas are good enough to tell people all the time but uh but you also have to be willing to just realize like that if one person likes it that's pretty good and then you hope more than that obviously yeah yeah, yeah. if you want to make a sustainable living right. off of what right. you're doing exactly you're more, than one more than one person. unless that person's really rich yeah, <laughs> totally and then you're fine yeah um 
Yeah, I think that y- you tend to get more um, uh, empathy once you start creating stuff and putting it out there and, and you have your name on it. I yep. think then you start to realize um, that and, and understanding what that person went through to make something. And I yeah. think it's okay to criticize ideas, criticize maybe people that... Um, that's the balance that I have that, that I that I struggle with because I do think, you know, say if you're in an open forum and you're, you're debating an idea with somebody. Yeah. In a lot of ways, you're criticizing that person and what they stand for. I don't do it much, but <laughs> yeah. it's like you see it a lot, especially now with politics and how everything is totally. just on fire. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah. But I guess where, where do you stand on that in terms of, of uh, cr- criticizing work? Do you I mean, I guess you probably don't have much space for it. Yeah. I mean, I try not to like I, I only would. uh I think you watch things and you're critical of them only in the way of like, well, if I were to get an opportunity like this, maybe I would do it like this. I wouldn't do that. It's not my taste. Um, but try not to be like just slamming something for the sake of it. It's, you know, I try and I, I critical when I watch things, like feel like very critical a lot, but, but only in so much as like thinking of like how I could, could have made it better or how I could be better or recognizing something that, you know, you could learn from. And I mean, I think that's a lot of even watching like everything that you make, you would like, if I did it again, I would do it differently. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. It's, it, you can't take too high of a ground be like, this is terrible. Cause you, you know, you probably will make something that someone will feel that way about too. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, funny. totally. Um, but I think the goal is just always like, if you can argue on its behalf, like, like, like we were talking about like, uh, offending people or something. If you, think you if you feel like if someone you could picture even just somebody being like this is terrible if you feel like you would be comfortable being like no you're wrong then i think you should always say or work on those projects Mm -hmm. and even if even if it's not necessarily offensive but just something that you're have like an emotional attachment to some of the recent projects you've worked on the carmichael show in broad city yeah pretty amazing to to have those opportunities to write for these shows yeah it was awesome um what was broad city first broad city was first yeah yeah that came me and kevin did a um uh, after Friends of the People and we did a, we had pitched a, an idea to NBC and done a script with them together and then after that we went it was like probably a couple months after that we started working on uh, at Broad City and I'm curious like take me into the, that that process and that experience uh, obviously you've you had a little bit of experience writing for a show I mean yeah. two seasons at Friends of the People right um, so what was that like uh, it was I mean it was it was it was just great because it was like you're coming into it. You're like a very awesome opportunity. You're coming into a show. It's in. It was the, this is going to be the fourth season. So it was like they had made a lot of incredible work. So you're coming into this thing that like they know what they, they know what the show is. And like mm-hmm. it was this, you know, both that and the Carmichael show were cool experiences because they're comedians who created the show and have a really clear voice and like have it makes it just so fun to write for because you just know ex- you know that it's being guided by these people who really have a vision for what they want and those are always like think we've been proven in time to be the best shows always sort of like what yeah. I was talking about earlier like when someone it's based on this happened to me or this is something that I really care about and I want to convey that emotion in some sort of a scene it's like those things are always so authentic and I mean it's cool too watching these shows and being fans of them and then and being like oh I really like this show and these are people that I've known, uh, people who've made these shows are people that I knew before they had these shows, you know, just from doing stand up and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So you have this relationship with the, with them as just like a peer doing stand up or whatever. And then to just, when you get in the room, you're like, Oh, the reason this is great is because they're great and they are really, really awesome at this and they know exactly what it's. So it's just cool to, to glean all that and help where you can be a part of it. So when, so I, I'm curious about the actual dynamic of like in the room, how many writers are on the show and, and how does uh, the process it work? Was, Broad City was smaller, a yeah. smaller room. Um, and the Carmichael show was a larger room. It was so like, I think Broad City would be anywhere from like, sort of varied over the time we were there. It was like five to eight people. And then the Carmichael show was about 12, maybe about mm-hmm. th- probably about 12. Um, and uh, obviously very different because one's a single cam and one's a multi-cam show so the production schedule we weren't there for the production on broad we we're just there for the uh the writing, writing yeah. part and that, that's pretty intimate though five to eight people yeah oh yeah it's of- super intimate yeah it was really um yeah it was like 
get to know everybody. It's just like a very, it, it's just really fun. It, it was like, a, you know, you're basically, you know, boarding ideas or boarding episodes or pitching mm. ideas in the beginning where it's more just like open gotcha. to what you're talking about. And then as things get whittled down to like, okay, this is going to be an episode and populating it with how the story is going to be structured and how it's going to work. Um, those are sort of like the, you know, the arc of writing. Right. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I am curious about that process too. So it, it obviously starts out big ideas yeah. and y you go into it, I imagine with, do you go into it with, so this is probably episode one, two, three, four, five, six. Like this is the structure of it or um, is it nothing? Like, Well, stuff? it's, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, this is, you know, you're, working for them towards the vision that they want to have. So it's like they may come in with that sort of idea of like, this is going to be how the season's going to be arced or something like that. But you're there to just sort of, you know, came in with episode ideas or topics that I thought would be cool for the show. Kevin and I had like met, we worked on these shows together mm -hmm. and wrote episodes together. So we had met up before both rooms started where we'd be like, okay, let's just talk about like ideas that we think would be cool so that we could come in prepared with, ideas and just even you know not necessarily pitch them all on day one or something like that but as it like organically yeah. came up be like oh well we actually had thought about this thing that you know because tend to be over preparers for stuff and want to you know a lot of great ideas end up coming up organically in the room but sometimes it's nice to like those jumping off points and both rooms are really cool about like the idea of in the beginning you know coming in with you know, being open to lots of ideas and hearing everything. And then, you know, the people who are, you know, running the show, whittling down to the things that they're most passionate about or, and then you start to design episodes out of that. Yeah. I think that's actually amazing advice is go into a project uh, or go in, never go into a project or a meeting or a client call or anything without being extremely prepared and having a couple ideas yeah. to present. I think it's always good to have them, but also be re don't try and jam them in. That's always like yeah. a mistake too that I feel like in early writers rooms you learn of like if you came in too much with like all right I'm going to pitch this today and then you're just sitting there waiting to pitch that thing in the right <laughs> moment you'll miss other things. If you're just like listening and just talking, you may come up with something really cool. Or there's a day where it's like oh we're talking about this this would actually make sense here as opposed to like <laughs> trying to like be like, Oh, you're talking about dogs. I had this idea <laughs> about a, uh, not a dog, but a person who would be, you know, and it's just like, everyone's like, Oh, that's not what we're talking. Yeah, no, about. that's yeah. not on the same stream of thought. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point is that, uh, you have these kind of in your arsenal and, and you're ready to go with them, but you have to listen. And, and a lot of times if you're just getting started on a project, that's probably the most important thing that you could do to really understand what the the creators and or the totally. client is actually looking for yeah and and no because you know on these two particular shows it's driven by these like incredibly talented people who <laughs> could write like you know have amazing ideas that they already know would be great for the yeah. show so you just want to like you don't want to be like uh you know you want to hear what where but both were like very like oh this is like a blue sky week just say whatever you want to say and um I just thought, I, I mean, just, both were just awesome. They were truly yeah. like, I feel very lucky to have worked on both. I just thought, thought of the saddest thing ever where you were saying like, don't go into something and just say, I have to say this because I told myself I would. Yeah. And like I, I had a flashback to like eighth grade dance <laughs> oh, <no. Yeah. laughs> where right. like I was like going to ask this girl that was my friend to right. dance with oh, me. Oh man, yeah. And I was like, I, I was going to ask her out and I had told totally. other people that I was going to ask right. her out. You put yourself in a corner. Yeah. yeah. And then like I, I she, she, like I went up to go ask her to dance with me Yeah. and then she ran away. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I had a tough childhood. Yeah, and then she, I was just like, threw my, put my hands out, like, okay, I guess, I guess that's not gonna work out. Yeah. And then she ended up, I guess, she felt bad, and then yeah. she came back and danced with me. Oh, that's great, guilty. But then people. I still asked her out, <laughs> and even she, though, and she, she said, said no. no. Yeah, yeah, no. It's Dude, you got, yeah, yeah you gotta be able to audible. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta know yeah, to change the plan. Yeah, you don't want to be too much. Like I had another one where I, you. I had a similar situation where it was like, kept asking this girl, like, can you ask your friend if she likes me? Like trying to go through her. And then the report back was like, she doesn't feel that way about you. <laughs> and then I was like, well, just ask her again. And she's like, I, I'm giving you the report. And I was like, you know what? Other people are telling me that you probably are wrong. Even though this is a person who's a, their best friend, you know, cause yeah. you just are like, you know what? I'm not going to be afraid. And then I did it and was like, oh no, she was right. <laughs> The, the intelligence was exactly well, yeah, right. Yeah, I the decided, intel was good. Uh, yeah, the intel was very good, and I just blew right through it. Uh, this but, might explain 
uh, our lives right now yeah, in, in some of this childhood regression yeah. where we just bury these these <laughs> right. these horrible things. But yeah, I think that's those are sort of how those rooms worked. You know, they were like asking a girl out at a dance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, what are you most excited about uh, moving forward and um, kind of future projects? Yeah. You know, the one big thing about stand up. Uh, from from what I know is that everybody's trying to somehow tell their story or bring a part of themselves and their experience into a project and mm-hmm. um, trying less and less to be in stand up ma- saying jokes as opposed to being yourself or yeah. at least a reflection of that. Is that something you look for as you continue to create projects? And, and what are some of the big things you're looking to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, for me personally, it's like I really I'm really excited. I really like working with friends i've been fortunate to get to work with people who are my friends a lot of time and i think that there's some real comfort in those projects because there's sort of like you know you know what their style is or what they would feel compelled to so i think sort of building those projects with like kevin and i are working on a couple of projects together and um working on other projects with friends and we're just trying to you know, I, I've always wanted to create my own stuff, like create shows, movies, um, and stand up. obviously is in and of itself, clearly like you're creating your stand up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, take opportunities to pitch and work on stuff while, you know, taking opportunities to write for shows or people that I, I really, really enjoy. Right. I think that's what it is, right? It's just continuing to enjoy the work you do and like creating those alliances and those friendships, yeah. because if you were doing this stuff by yourself, um, it wouldn't be as as fun. Yeah, I think it's. I, I always like. It's fun to work. Stand up obviously is always an outlet to have completely by yourself. You know, mm-hmm. um, but in other stuff, it's. I find it. You know, it. It's always good to be protective of the tone of something. I feel like that's always the. You know, when you have too many people collaborating, it's harder to hold on to like the tone is like a, a more finer point. But like I think always having when you agree on that and everybody's in agreement, it's always fun to be there and pitch with people and um you know so those are sort of like the broader strokes things i hope to do is you know create projects and continue to get to hopefully write for things that i feel really good about you know i guess my goals are to have it go good and not be at the (laughs) end being like oh fuck and then it's just too late that's all i want i just don't want to i've always pictured just not dying being like oh my god what a huge wow this was such yeah like on your deathbed whole... your last words are like oh no yeah, yeah oh no <laughs> this is so fucked you know so like that's really the major goal is to avoid that emotion and so that's sort of driving all of it as much as like there's been all these flowery things of like you know i really want to create things that make me it really is i just don't want to die being like oh fuck (laughs) that's really it that's actually a great point because that's like you said you're going to have these moments where you may be fucked up you did fuck up you had a bad experience this project didn't work out the way you thought but you're dedicated to keep going and not end on a fuck up <laughs> yeah you don't want to end on the oh fuck and maybe i will maybe and we'll talk again i'll be like listen i actually realize when you fail this yeah. big it's better to just just delete everything and just go into the sunset that would be like a beautiful ending though in a lot of ways totally no i mean like, if I think, that was a movie that would actually be a pretty good ending i think oh yeah it's not bad yeah. i mean my backup plan has always been that i would go to a place that had very i like bagels a lot you know so i would go to a town that has very low bagel density like they don't have a good bagel store and i would just open i'd be like the bagel guy in that town and then i just everyone there's nowhere else to get a bagel so they would just come to me and i'd be like the guy with the bagels that's it's smart that's always what i think about so that would be my that would be after the oh fuck is the bagel store and then if the bagel store plummets then it's like <laughs> you'll just never see me again that's it <laughs> yeah now i'll go live in the woods that's genius the, that's i, I that's kind of like the the worst case scenario too it's like worst case scenario i'll just open up a bagel store right which it sounds a lot it sounds nice in theory but it's really hard to make a good bagel and i you know i read about it a lot do you yeah there is i really want to I really want to, I do want to do it at some point, genuinely. So we'll Thanks. see. But, um, dude, I love bagels. You got to yeah. let me know because I'm a big bagel fan. There's a yeah. bagel smith right here. I oh, don't great. Been to it, but yeah, no, that's a very successful bagel store. Yeah, yeah. They're doing great. Yeah, they're big. They're like a chain now. They got a bunch of them. I know. I would love to, you know, have my bagel smith at some point, but what, I don't know if that'll happen. What, what's your favorite bagel in New York? 
Um, that's a good question. I really like this one by my apartment. It's called Montague Street Bagels. They're really good. Essa Bagels are obviously very good and mm-hmm. famous. Bagelsmith makes good bagels. My favorite one <laughs> historically is the, it's in my hometown. It's probably, it's called uh, Harrison Bagels. Yeah. They have great bagels. Shout out to Harrison Bagels. <laughs> they make a great bagel. Wait, have you ever, have you ever, uh, been to, where is it? What's that? Canada. It's not Toronto. Oh. What's the, the, the French version? Oh, Montreal? Yeah, Montreal. Was it Montreal? What are you? Is that the one that's right up here? That that they do bagels very oh, differently. Uh, maybe you're talking about black seed bagels. I think that's. I think so. Is it in Montreal? Montreal is the one where they speak French. Yes. Okay. Let me start that over. <laughs> I have not been to Black Seed Bagels, but I've heard that it's oh, yeah, a, uh, yeah, a, a I got different it. take on a bagel. Yeah. Well, they have like a rosemary bagel. Yeah, that it's sounds very great. thin. Um, it's definitely a different. It's a different take. It's not. It's not like a New York bagel. Sure. It's not the same experience. Yeah. But it's still pretty. Damn no, good. that'd be great. I think I would have all sorts of options at my bagel store. There's a lot of big hopes and a lot of big dreams, um, but it's going to be in a very low bagel density place. Like it won't be here. It'll <laughs> yeah, be, you're you'll have to like, that. you'll really have to, cause I don't, I want to go, well, it's probably very hard to launch a bagel store in New York. It's probably the most oh, competitive bagel market. Very. So difficult. I would probably go to it like literally a place where there's no competitors because <laughs> I just wouldn't, the idea of opening the bagel store and closing it would be tough. <laughs> I feel like eventually you're going to make a movie about a, a bagel store. store. It's bagel going to be called keeps, The Bagel Store. Yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, all right. You want to do quick questions? Okay. No. no. Quick questions? Okay. Sure. Yeah. It's a segment. I have to answer quickly? No. I, well, not really. It's more so uh, the, the questions are quick. Oh, and okay. then the, the answers are just as long as you want them to be. So. Okay. There's really no... Uh, it's not like one of those things where you have to answer like a millisecond after it's said because you're trying to get like the rawest. Yeah, the, the, yeah, like a Rorschach test. Yeah, those have, are always really... Um, what one skill should people learn today that will help them in five years? Um, I guess like, you know, like a serious answer would be, I guess, like uh, being cool with failing. I think mm-hmm. I think that's like I really I feel like it for me has been an asset is how much I accept and embrace the idea that things don't go well sometimes so I think yeah. that that's really helpful because I've had a lot of weird like with work I think inevitably like a lot of things have gone right and wrong but like those moments where you're like oh this kind of this kind of sucks but uh finding that those moments even funnier is I, for me it been a helpful thing do you try to create a work-life balance um yeah yeah i do i was always a little pretty conscious that i've uh wanted to i think that there's sometimes like being outside of work is where you can find new ideas that excite you because you're you know when you first start you are a person in a world that has no you're not in the world of the work that you're doing at all. And you had all these ideas. So sometimes it's nice to be outside of it. Cause then you have, you, you have authentic experiences where you're like immersed with people who don't do what you do. I think that's really nice to be around. So I've always been motivated to, I, um, I'm in a happy relationship, so that's good. Um, and, uh, so I'll, 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 I think so. Yes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> or I, think, I don't know. Or I don't know. I mean, there's a chance that you should just put yourself only into your work because there's also people, there's really good examples of people who have no social life and are far more successful. You know what? I think it's probably like, a, <laughs> it's a, it's a case by case basis. And maybe some people just aren't good with relationships and right. they're better just to work. Yeah. And, be, and so there's a real out. chance that you shouldn't do that, but there's also <laughs> a chance that you should really, it just, you should do what, you know, makes you not be completely miserable but then also i would say there's some people who seem to push themselves towards misery and it does wonders for them so i don't yeah well that's the interesting thing is that uh, i feel like there's a lot of um comedians i I don't know if this is um a stereotype that comedians are all like unsatisfied miserable people uh i think that's pretty i mean i think unsatisfied is probably right because i think that there is this like it's this continual churn, like stand up, especially is like this thing that feels like this lifelong, you're like, you're never done. It's mm-hmm. like you put out this and it's like, but then you got to put out that and you're trying to always put out new things. So there is sort of an unsatisfied feeling, whereas, uh, which I'm sure exists with, which exists with filmmaking too. Filmmaking is a little more like a project ends and you put it out. Whereas stand up is sort of this never ending thing where you do put out stuff at times. But um, yeah, I'd say that, unsatisfaction probably is a helpful thing but you know being happy at moments could be good or not being i don't you know just don't 
it's funny because there's a question in here that's how do you face doubt and i feel like that was our whole episode is yeah. talking about how do we o- <laughs> yeah. overcome doubt i think you overcome yeah you just embrace the idea that you don't know and also be really just i think it's fun to fail sometimes in a funny yeah. way and like i mean there's obviously versions of it that have been like terrible and you're like oh this is horrible but as long as you keep going the only way that you don't succeed in what you're doing is if you stop right after a major failure then you so as long as you keep going you can find like a higher point to leave on probably yeah and it makes good stories usually totally like oh, down yeah. the road like some of my biggest failures are, are some of my favorite stories oh completely yeah it's the little it's like the little things like you talk about this a lot in your stand-up is like being awkward and and, and yeah. stuff and it's like those the cringe things though like oh. the smaller moments are the ones i don't like to look back on and they're not funny <laughs> yeah, stories yeah, and you're like i just yeah. don't ever want to remember that incident yeah. ever again yeah no um what's your if you had like a thing that was your favorite material possession or most i, I would say what's your favorite thing material possession yeah your favorite thing like you're looking oh, around the man. room like i don't know <laughs> i don't know i don't have anything that i like no uh try to think yeah, you have these like, I have this, <laughs> I have this hat. It's my Hogs hat. It's actually a uh, Arkansas Razorbacks hat that I wore every day from like eighth grade through twelfth grade, and it's disgusting and has a huge holes in it. And but I've kept it, and it's been in everywhere that I've lived. And it just I like having it like on my desk when I work because I just remember that I used to wear this horrible hat every day and I thought it would change everything like I really thought like <laughs> when, when I put this hat on I was like okay now I'm the coolest guy in the world but yeah. that doesn't that doesn't how it works so it's a nice <laughs> reminder to know that this hat still continues to exist to remind me of that I'm just a an idiot who has no idea what to do <laughs> that's great um all right last question question one name one thing that people should read before they go to bed tonight Ooh. um man that's tough we well, you know because you don't want people to waste their time you know and they, you, <laughs> you can also say start reading they don't have to finish the whole book yeah so. just start reading um I'm trying to think of what i read recently that i really liked um there's a couple things I really, I just, I don't, didn't understand it, but it was fun to read. Was uh, a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking. <laughs> you said he didn't understand it. I mean, I understood parts of it, but it was fun to read because it, it's like that right level of like, oh man, I'm getting this, and then there's something where you're like, ah, oh, I don't get that. Yeah, not at but, all. But it was, uh, I'd say, read that because it's important to remember that the universe is expanding and that we don't really know a lot of stuff, and that there's something kind of. I find that kind of fun to remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that you're just on a rock and a big thing yeah. and you don't know why. And you forget, and especially in New York, like you can't really look up and see the stars. Totally. So you, you, you forget. But I remember growing up, it's like looking up at the stars and realizing like, oh yeah, like this problem I have right now is not a big deal. Yeah. Nobody cares about this problem. Yeah. Like the earth won't exist eventually. That's yeah. like, I think always a good thing to know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that is reassuring in some ways. I think that'll help you like sleep. sleep. Yeah. yeah, totally. I think yeah. like if you're like, oh man, but... I can't get the financing. It's like, well, the earth is not going to, there won't be even be an earth. There's going to be no earth in the next. Or maybe they'll figure out a way to keep it, but um, I think it's going to go. Yeah, I think it's going to, I think we're, we have like, I mean, we're going to be here, I think. Well, with global warming and stuff, we, we're not really yeah, sure. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> so that's the whole thing, you know? All right, guys. So thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, um, good luck out there. What, how should people connect with you online? Um, you could connect with me uh, on Twitter. I just started doing Instagram actually like two months ago. I, I think I like Instagram. I've never been a big social media person, but yeah. if you want to go Dude, on your, Instagram. Dude, your first post. Oh, yeah. That's another possession I really like. That, I mean, but, honestly, that's got to be an all-time high for you. Oh, yeah. No, that was really cool. I have Will Smith autograph telling me to stay jiggy. That's important. <laughs> Is that something that you just always that's internalize that's every, day? every day? It's in my head. I'm just trying to do it, and every day I don't live up to it. But. Stay jiggy with it. Um, all right, cool. So thanks for listening, and that's the show. Thanks for being on. Thank you for having me. I hope it was good. It was great. Great.